Well, a lot of moving pieces in the global chess match right now. Russia warning today that Ukraine is about to launch a massive false flag operation where they would strike children's hospitals using Russian weapons in order to rally support from the West. Is their support from the West fading and they need some sort of large false flag operation to wake Biden up? I don't know. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin doubled down on his warning to the West. If the U.S. allowed and supported long-range strikes inside of Russia, it would mean NATO is at war with Russia. And according to the New York Times, the U.S. is scared of escalating a hot war with Russia. Do you buy that? It's really the Brits that are trying to make this move? Well, let's ask uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. Um, who is in the uh, in in the new studio, and I'm thrilled to have uh, the colonel here to talk about all of this and more. Colonel, great to see you today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Clayton. Good to be with you. So, a couple of moving pieces I want to get your take on. We have this this Houthi strike inside of Tel Aviv using a hypersonic missile. We have Zelensky, uh, Zelensky fanboy. Uh, just trying to assassinate Donald Trump. The timing of all of this is, is very suspect. First, before we get into a couple of these other big stories, I want to get your take on this as latest assassination attempt and the fact that we now know that this individual was in Ukraine. He was there trying to recruit Americans to go fight against Russia. And the timing of him suddenly showing up at this particular hole on this golf course when the Secret Service, we now know today, this was a snap decision for Trump to even play golf, that he happened to show up at that exact moment. What, just give me your initial reaction to that from, from your close relationship with President Trump. Well, one has to conclude that uh, there are very few accidents of this kind. I mean, that's too much of a coincidence to dismiss out of hand. I, I, I don't know is the is the basic answer to your question, because I don't have access to what the Secret Service and FBI know. We already have lots of unanswered questions about the first attempt. You know, as I was talking to someone very recently, they said, well, he was almost killed. And I said, are you sure? And they said, well, look, it just grazed one side of his head. I said, well, if, if a professional assassin was at work and could shoot that well, there would have been a second bullet almost immediately that would have gone right through his forehead. And no such, such a second bullet ever occurred. Instead, what we have is this wild shooting spree into the crowd, which made no sense whatsoever. Now we have this man who seemingly comes out of nowhere, but has you know some connectivity to the Ukraine operation, which means connectivity to the CIA, because the CIA has a major hand in running the war in Ukraine. They're the ones spinning right. the narrative, lying to everybody that the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal all repeat uh, without question. So the whole thing stinks, I think, is the, is the only answer I can come up with. It smells bad. It doesn't make any sense. The timing is so fascinating to me as well, right at a moment where you have, according to the New York Times, a sort of waffling by the Biden administration on sending or allowing the use of long range weapons to attack inside of Russia. The UK appears to be the, the, the bullies here, the strong arm, but the Biden administration not willing to escalate. And then you have this Ukrainian connection on an attack on President Trump. And now this news of a large scale false flag operation from the Russian side that's about to happen uh, against children's hospitals in order to rally support from the West. Again, the timing on all of this stinks. What do you make of that? Well, we, we have examples of where the Ukrainians had done things and then blamed it on the Russians in the hope that this would build support for Ukraine. You had this early on in, in a ma what was deemed as a mass atrocity against Ukrainians, where the Russians supposedly went into a town and killed everybody and left the bodies lying around. We now have testimony from the French journalists who have investigated it and have eyewitness accounts that there were no Russians there at all. And the people in this town were Ukrainians who were killed by other Ukrainians in order to create the impression that the Russians were indiscriminately killing civilians. And of course that fits with the CIA MI6 narrative that you continue to read in all the Western media. So I think the false flag issue should not be dismissed. It's eminently possible. But I would argue that the much more important message is the one that you referred to, 
that Putin has now delivered. And it's a very straightforward one. He says, clearly, the Ukrainians do not have the capability to launch any of these long-range strike systems like the Shadow, or in France, it's called the uh, Storm Shadow. In France, they call it the Scout Missile. They can't launch these things at any given targets because they depend entirely on our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets in space. We are providing them with the data. We are providing them with the launch capability. And then they get, undoubtedly, technical assistance. Just as right now in Iran, there are thousands of Russians on the ground in Iran helping the Iranians to build up an air and missile uh, defense system. Uh, you have the same thing going on with us in Ukraine. And so Putin has said, look, if this happens, we know who's responsible. It's not the Ukrainians. And we're going to take action. Now, I think he's aiming first and foremost because the storm shadow is a British weapon at the British. Now, what is he going to do? What will the Russians do? They're saying conceivably it could lead to a state of war because they're tired of the nonsense. In other words, they're saying, we're going to treat you as a co-belligerent. Well, that's possible, but you know, that would be out of character for him to strike targets in England at this point, even though they could do it. I think instead they'll probably pick targets where the British are concentrated, much like the Poltava strike. The Poltava strike killed upwards of 740 people. There were large numbers of Swedish, Polish, we think British and American officers, non-commissioned officers training Ukrainians there. So the Russians know where everything is, and that was a case of a couple of Iskander missiles that have a range of about 250 to 300 miles with a 1,500-pound warhead. Now, I, I don't know with great certainty what will happen, but we know the Storm Shadow, for instance, has a range of about 155 miles, and what they try to do with it is launch it from an aircraft. It flies very low, and it is subsonic, which means that it does not fly faster than the speed of sound, Anything that does not fly faster than the speed of sound can be targeted fairly easily if you pick it up as it flies nap of the earth, as we call it. So I think the Russians can probably shoot these things down. They'll be looking for them. But still, it's a hit or miss proposition. And I think they'll look for targets uh, where there's evidence for the presence of U.S. and NATO forces, and they'll hit those. But this does not exclude the possibility that if missiles are launched or aircraft are launched from Poland or Romania or Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, that they will not strike targets in those countries. That is that is a very real possibility. Now, that in, in connection with that, we have to go back now to your earlier question about, the, about NATO and, and what are people going to think and how are they going to react. And I think Washington very definitely does not one to escalate this war to the level of a state versus state confrontation. In other words, the United States and its allies versus Russia. Very clearly, I don't think we want that. What do we want? I think we want to keep the war going, sadly. I think that's the real goal in Washington. Let this grinding tragedy play out right up through and beyond the election and leave this mess in the lap of Donald Trump for instance, or leave it for solution after the election when the attitude will be, well, now we can get out or now we can end it or now we can do something else because the election's over. This is the tragedy of American electoral politics. We've been through this so many times in our history. It's it's awful. You know, you, you can remember 68, 69, 70, 71, 72. We went through the same sort of thing with Nixon. Well, I think that's what's happening right now inside the administration. So I think the allegation that we don't want to escalate is accurate. On the other hand, you have this man, Starmer, who is at war with his own population. He's locking people up who are opposed to the massive influx of foreigners into Britain. He's punishing his own people. At the same time, he is a strident advocate for war with Russia. No question about it. He doesn't seem to understand how vulnerable Britain and NATO is to Russian weapons and capabilities. So I would think that uh, he's capable of dragging us into something that we ultimately don't want, which is an open war between the United States and Russia. You know, the Russians have put to sea in the Black Sea a number of ships. The ships collectively, as at least as of 48 hours ago, 
uh, carry a, a minimum of 48 missiles, Iskander type missiles that can fly 300 miles and hypersonic and so forth. But there are other vessels out there, submarines and so forth. There's a lot of evidence that there's a buildup for a major Russian ground offensive as well as an, more missile offensives that we've seen in, in recent days. It, it's very important that people note that. We're, we're on the threshold of something really big coming out of Russia in Ukraine. I think the Russians have finally decided they've let this war drag on too long. And I think they've decided they've wasted time waiting for someone with common sense to negotiate. So I think they're going to set the terms of battle and ultimately the terms of victory. I think that's what we're going to witness now in October and November. At the same time, people need to keep their eyes on Mr. Netanyahu's threat to invade and destroy southern Lebanon, because that could be the trigger for dramatic events in the entire region. That could bring on a major war, not just with Iran, but with other states. Need to watch Egypt. General Sisi is hanging by a thread. He's extremely unpopular with his population, who see him as a, an Israeli and U.S. puppet. The same thing is true for King Abdullah in Jordan. His entire government resigned 24 hours ago and walked away from him. I don't think that Abdullah or Sisi are going to survive this crisis and conflict. That means that the, these huge states, 100 million people in uh, Egypt, and then, of course, 11-plus million uh, Palestinians living in Jordan, all of these people are hostile and are ready to attack Israel. We haven't even discussed what could happen in Syria, and we now know that Mr. Erdogan has said publicly, if the Israelis go into Lebanon, that is a red line for him. They're not just going to sit there. They're very concerned about the very high probability that more Arab refugees will be driven into Turkey. And it's going to cost them far more money to house them and care for them than they can afford because their economy isn't that strong. But even though it's not that strong, they're willing to risk confrontation over this issue. And then, of course, everybody knows about Iran that's been preparing and preparing and preparing for what they think is an inevitable Israeli assault on them from the air, from the sea, with missiles. So we're, we're, we're really on the edge of the abyss now. People need to wake up. Americans need to put down the beer, get up off the couch, and pay attention to what's happening. Because they could wake up to regional wars that combined begin to look awfully global. I've been really worried about the sort of wag the dog, you know, as we head into this election. And I know it's, it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory at this point, but that we would try, you know, try to rally the American people around a common enemy, whether it's through a false flag or some other strategy. This combination over the past 24 hours of this U.S. and U.K. propaganda telling us that Iran and Russia teaming up to bring us, you know, to create a, a force of nuclear weapons. So I keep looking for these signs of the wag the dog moment, and every morning I'm sort of surprised by the new headlines, and I see today the UK and US warning about a, an alliance to build a, you know, a Iranian nuclear weapons and with Russia, and now we need to fear that. Um, what's well, the truth here? You, you say wag the dog, and I think it's interesting that if you listen to Zelensky and Netanyahu, they both have a similar objective. Both of them want desperately to drag the United States into war on their behalf. That's quite right. clear. So we're already the dog being wagged at this point. The question hmm. is, are, are we going to be wagged and dragged right over the finish line, which means open war with Russia, Iran, and potentially China, and who knows el who else in the, in the Middle East? I mean, the, the entire region is up in arms right now against Israel. Th that's another question. Now, to Get back real quick to something else you mentioned, this missile the Houthis launched. Remember, it flew 1,300 miles in, we estimate, about 12 minutes. A hypersonic, that, yes. That sounds hypersonic to me. That may have flown at, say, 4,500 or 4,900 uh, miles per hour. Anything over 4,500 miles per hour is hypersonic. And it can go all the way up to 7,600 7, miles per hour, which we don't see very often. So most of it is uh, Mach 5, Mach 6. It's not going to get to Mach 7.
But the point is, it seems like it was probably hypersonic. And if they say it wasn't, then the question is, why didn't Israeli air defense elements not shoot it down? Because if it's slower than uh, hypersonic, then you can target it and you can shoot it out of the sky. But it didn't happen. So, I, you know, I don't know what to believe, except we know the Houthis flew this thing 1,300 miles in 12 minutes and landed it right in the middle of Tel Aviv. If I were an Israeli, I would take that quite seriously, wouldn't you? Absolutely. And... Yeah, the question is why wasn't it shot down if it could have been shot down and if it and if it if they don't if they couldn't shoot it down because it's hypersonic then that speaks to the power that of these weapons that they have in their arsenal and the United States and Israel appear not to have a response to that, no? No, I I think that's right. I I don't think we can defend against hypersonic missiles. The United States cannot, neither can the Israelis. Now we have the capability to build and launch hypersonic missiles. All of your intercontinental ballistic missiles, by the way, are hypersonic, which is why nobody can shoot them down. That's why if you escalate to the strategic level with nuclear weapons, you might as well bid farewell to everybody you know because you're going to be destroyed. No one can shoot it down. No one can stop it. There is no defense against it. I I think this is an interesting point that we've reached, if you stop and consider it. We've been on a long journey journey to a very dangerous destination. The destination has always been confrontation with Russia and Iran and potentially others now. All we have to do is look at BRICS, and BRICS uh, controls at least 40% of the gold in the world, and they're talking about going to another currency inside BRICS that excludes us that will be based on gold, at least partially, if not completely. All of these things seem to be moving in parallel, economic, political, and military. Everyone is divorcing themselves from the United States and Israel. It's that simple. And we have a few diehards like Starmer over in London, who's at war with his own people, who also wants to go to war with Russia. And he's dangerous because he, like Boris Johnson, his predecessor, could easily drag us into a wider conflict. I don't think there's any question of it. In the meantime, the Germans have said, no more aid to Ukraine. So the Germans have opted out. That's very important. So what's NATO doing? Well, everybody always asks that question. NATO, Clayton, is Washington, effectively, with some strap hangers, Britain having been the most frequent one, and occasionally the French or the Dutch, The Germans have always been reluctant partners when it came to external warfare. They're now out of it as far as Ukraine is concerned. (laughs) Absolute tinderbox. Uh, Colonel, before we let you go, um, I know you guys are launching a new website. And, of course, uh, tell our audience, you know, people want a solution to all of this mess. Where can they turn? Well, the the interesting thing is a, a new platform owned by One Truth Media called Republic, R-E colon public, has has been launched as of last week. What's unique about it? First of all, the servers are privately owned. That's very important. Secondly, there is no advertisement on the platform. In other words, no big corporate advertising money that could hold republic hostage to their political will. What does all of this mean? It means that republic is a free speech platform. Now, anybody can go on republic. You just Google for it. It'll come up. You can go on and read what is whatever is being posted there. But if you want to take action, and there are opportunities to take actions, to contact political figures, contact people in your your neighborhood, your county, your city, your state about specific issues, to contact organizations across the entire country that share your values, your interests. You can do all all of that, but you have to then ultimately pay a fee. That fee is $180 a year unless you can get a discount code. My discount code is published on my own personal website, I've sent it out uh, on tweets. I try to get it out as many people as possible because then you only pay $120 a year, which is significant savings. But the nice thing about this platform is it doesn't matter if you're left or right or in the middle. You can be a pacifist. You could be a warmonger. You can post. 
You can put things there on that platform. You can write articles. You can circulate video, real-time video, immediate, uh, something that happened within the last 10 minutes or whatever you think is appropriate. The only thing you can't do is you can't post pornography, <clears throat> and we're not going to tolerate someone on the platform who is arguing for the destruction of our country. That we won't tolerate. But otherwise, you're on there. You're not going to be canceled. I mean, this morning I, I received all these notifications from people that said, you know, these uh, tweets, what I guess we call them X's now, that are out there, the people that sent those just 24 hours ago have now been thrown off the platform. They've been censored. They've been canceled for whatever it was that they said. That cannot happen on this platform. So they've got their own servers. It, they're not hostage to someone else's servers. They're not taking money from any, anyone. This is going to be self-funding, which is why you have a fee. Now, if you're a small business of less than 500 employees, you're a small fa a farmer, you may have 1,000 acres, but you have less than 500 employees, you can get on there and you can advertise to your heart's content. We want small business to succeed. We're trying to keep out big corporate interests who are trying to shape policy, shape thinking, shape attitudes. We don't want their shaping influence on the platform. So if you believe in free speech, you want free speech, Republic is the place you really need to go. Wonderful. Well, we'll have it up here um, on the screen and in the description as well uh, so people can check it out. Uh, very exciting. And I think, you I know, think obviously I free speech is... that you need to get that discount. You might publish that for people. Okay. We'll make sure it's in it's the description worth, for... It's worth the effort to go, to go to the link to save 80 bucks or $60. Absolutely. Rather. Yeah, we'll make sure that people can use that discount code if they want to sign up and uh, become a part of this. Free speech is under attack, and we need platforms like this so people can get the truth about what's happening in their country. Colonel Douglas McGregor, always great to see you. Thank you so much for your insights and analysis, as always. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.